Good day, Matthew. Uh, Steve Roman here, CEO at Global Atomic, and glad to be with you here uh, beginning of May. Steve, good to see you. getting ready for the coronation here shortly, right? And I can think of nothing else. In fact, I need this interview to fly through. I've got bunting to put up. Um, we, we, we should talk about your trip to The Hague, okay? You you were there. Lots of the great and great and the good um, at The Hague. What were you there for, and did you um, get what you wanted out of the session? The Hague was awesome, uh, really. Uh, there was everybody there that was uh, a key player in the nuclear industry, uh, all the utilities, fuel buyers, uh, politicians, uh and uh, heads of state. Uh, Global Atomic made a presentation there. So we introduced the company to uh, uh, basically the, the whole world in the nuclear space. Um, it was very, very good. Uh, I think people realize now, particularly after our presentation, that uh, even with uh, a number of other mines in Africa, uh, basically in Namibia, most of all, the production is going to China. So uh, I think people are now realizing that Global Atomic DASA project is really, on top of being the, the only greenfields uranium project currently under construction in the world, uh, it's probably one of the only ones that will be able to supply uh, yellow cake in the next two or three years. So, right. Okay. The, so, so lots of lots of lots of conversations, but just in terms of the who were you speaking to, what were you kind of keen to impart um, to them, and uh, you know, people always talk about term contracts and lots of U.S. utilities there. We know that from previous conversations. Lots of European utilities there, wanting to work out who's actually going to get over the line. So, what were you able to say to them on that front? Well, I we met with uh, a dozen utilities, and of course. A lot of them hadn't met with us before. Uh, they saw our presentation. We went through the information. Uh, they really liked the project. I would say across the board, uh, there was really no negative comments from any of them. Uh, and they're all now, because of uh, Russian sanctions, uh, looking for alternative supply. So uh, I think the great thing that came out of Olvig for us is that uh, we've been now put on the, the RFP or the bidders list uh, on pretty much all of these utilities that we met with. Um, so this is a lot of potential new business for Global Atomic uh, that wasn't there prior to me going to the Hague. So uh, that, that introduction to the, to the world market was very important for us. Right. And I think there's quite a few more sessions coming up um, before the end of this year as, as well, where um, utilities will be gathering. So keep us up to date with that. But he here's where I was going with that is part of what you've got to be able to say to them is we are going to be financed for the build to get into production. Okay. So you have partially done that. You went out to market uh, to raise 100 million. You announced that you'd close 56 million. So what happened there? And, and I guess, what are you going to do about that in terms of you know, closing out that equity uh, requirement? Well, that's a good question. And we've been asked that a number of times. Um, and I think there's some pressure in our market because people think we're coming back to the market sometime soon to do the other half. Uh, right now, we, we have about $60 million in the bank. We're moving uh, through the process. We're mining. We're over 1,000 feet down the, down the ramp. Uh, we should be in the top of the ore zone in the next three months, thereabouts. Um, so the project the project is progressing with the cash we have on board. Uh, the uh, the bank financing uh, that's all in process right now. And although it's slower than we expected, and we wanted to announce terms by the end of Q1, uh, now the banks are telling us, well, we should be able to announce terms by the end of Q2. Um, and typically what's happened out there is uh, you get then going from the stage of, uh, let's say, a, a letter of intent to a full-blown uh, documentation and you bring all the lawyers in and they have their legal team and we have our legal team and things take a lot longer once you get the whole legal community involved in these things. But 
it's looking positive. Uh, I'm still thinking that end of Q2, we should have firms on the bank debt. Uh, that will give us uh, 60% of our requirement. Now, the other thing people have to keep in mind is we've already spent 30 to 40 million last year on the project. This additional 60 million uh, is getting us pretty close to the top of uh, equ equity requirement. Now, just to have a little bit of, I would say, uh, flexibility or optionality. Uh, while we were in the Hague, we had a couple meetings with uh, carry trade groups. Carry trade are not like a utility, so they like to they'd like to attract some pounds. And of course, they've been pretty much cut out of the whole equation over the last number of years. So these guys are actually willing to make prepayments. And so we have a couple of those in the works right at the moment. We're waiting for some terms. If we get some prepayment on a carry trade sale, um, you know, selling pounds is selling pounds. We've got four and a half million pounds annual production to sell. We've sold about 700,000 pounds right now annually to let's say to 2020, 2031. But the banks are gonna need another probably 700 to a million pounds of sales prior to us being able to draw down on debt. So that'll cover all their costs, et cetera. So what we're doing is we're speaking to these carry trades and seeing whether we can come up with some sort of a, a, a good solution to maybe give us an additional uh, bit of equity without issuing shares, just by selling them pounds. And that's what we have. We have a lot of pounds that are going to, going to come out of the ground in 2025, beginning that year, which is not very far away. And uh, so I, I think we'll be able to come up with some sort of a alternative plan than just going back to the market and issuing more shares. Now, on top of that, there's some other groups that are interested in providing us a bridge loan in case we need additional capital. So. You know, we're, we're not waiting and we're not going to be whacking the market here soon. We've got enough cash to take us through the year with all the work we're doing uh, and wait for a couple more milestones to happen. The bank financing, the MR, that mineral resource estimate is now in the final state being completed on the 16,000 meters of drilling we did last year. I think that's going to have a big impact. So, you know, these, these milestones that we're expecting to have out here in the next couple of months, uh, I would say should have some positive effect. The uranium market, again, going back to The Hague, you know, the talk there from senior political people was that uh, the world's going to need another 200 gigawatts of nuclear energy here in the next 10 to 15 years. I mean, everybody was talking about a zero carbon by 2050, and uh, some of them were even talking 2040. And the other thing that was brought out at Hague was that the small modular reactors, in which there's a number of designs, that's going to shrink down to probably, let's say, four or five designs that will actually then come to market. But there's quite a few groups in there now designing small modular reactors. And the statement was made that there's probably four to 500 of those on order right now. I mean, none of that's been factored into the uranium price model. Uh, even with all the production out there right now coming on stream full blast, there's no way that we can handle all the demand. Um, so there's got to be new production and there really isn't a lot on the horizon. Okay. There's a lot of things you touched upon there. Do, do, do you mind if I just touch on a lot of things yeah, there? Yeah, all good as well. That's the good news. It's all full positive. But it always is with with uranium. So I just want to kind of take take down a, a little bit, just because there is a kind of a, a swathe of your shareholders and maybe even people looking in here, just going, look. Oh, and I appreciate what you said with regards to the optionality or the alternative financing uh, options that you've created creating for yourself. So with regards to the money that you did raise, that's on top of the 30 to 40 you said you'd already spent. So you're getting quite close to the level where the banks are happy with the equity portion, but you want to obviously have some buffer in there. So do you feel that the these carry trade guys are 
likely to give you enough to kind of get you over the line as far as, you know, so, well, it would, it would have been an extra 44 million bucks. I mean, are you saying, well, perhaps we were a bit, we didn't need as much as that or we don't need as much as that? I mean, how, how much topping up with this alternative financing do you think you're going to go for? Well, uh, the numbers that I'm talking about are 25 to 50 million. Okay, so a, a, a good chunk. And that would be obviously presumably discounted because it's a prepay, but nothing, not in a distressed manner. This would be normal market kind of discount for prepay, what do you think? That That's what I would say. I mean, uh, right now the, the price is, the spot price is above $50 a pound. Uh, and that's, of course, all subject to negotiation. So the key thing is is to uh, to get some pounds sold. As you know, we're a low-cost producer, so we do have some flexibility. And uh, the key thing from our point of view is to complete the build of the project. So that's what everybody needs to understand. We are a project that's in construction phase right now. The mine is going down. The earthworks have started cement uh, all the civils are going to start next quarter and into q3 long lead time items we've now got packages out there uh, and that uh, we should be making some further announcements on on that securing our our main components for the plant so this this is not something that we're waiting for markets uh, we are in the process of building a project so people have to realize that are you but are you you're making money at 50 bucks, right? Which is sort of roughly where it seems to be hovering or paused at the moment. You're making money at 50 bucks. So is, for that reason, you're kind of confident about getting on with things. Because there's a lot of conversations going on by, by you know, other, I guess, developers as they'd like to position themselves where perhaps the price that they're going to be able to achieve is going to be determined on them being able to raise capital. So they're not going to sign term contracts or spot price today. So they're, they're kind of delayed. So in terms of like a kind of first mover advantage situation, I mean, how do you take advantage of that? Or, you know, have you been able to take advantage of that with the conversations with utilities or, or, or quite frankly, even the carry trade? Well, I'll tell you that most utilities uh, seem to want product in 2025, 2026. Uh, some of them have contracts coming up in 2028. So the whole idea is to get enough there that we can profitably run the business and pay the banks, cover our costs, and then start layering in some contracts as uh, people will get comfortable with the project, comfortable with the company, and uh, have faith that we can deliver them some pounds. I mean, there's discussions we have and the fact that we're included now on, on RFP lists for these utilities uh, speaks volumes. I mean, they, they want to have supply coming from us. What, okay, um, we, we understand who the, the conventional um, producers um, have been, but in terms of the new developer um, uh, companies, do you think utilities understand exactly where they're at? Are they cute enough or, or, or astute enough, I should say, to understand that some projects are more likely than others to actually get into production at these sorts of prices or, quite frankly, below 80 bucks um i think they have done a lot of due diligence and so i would expect yes would be the answer they they're 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 wanting to sign on with people that they feel can deliver as you know we've already signed two agreements uh, one is definitive with uh, north american utilities so uh we wouldn't be able to do that unless they were confident we could deliver the pounds. And I think no, I, that's hmm. that's going to move through the rest of the the fleet, so to speak. But it, it's kind of interesting to me, you know. Like I, I hear what you were saying, you're confidently making these sorts of analysis, but it's also the silence is deafening from certain parts of the industry, and I'm not quite sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Is it a good thing for those that can get into production? Is it a bad thing because it, it says that I think pre you know companies that have previously been very vocal on what they could and couldn't do in or around the prices we're seeing today can't, and that's a factor of you know in, in inflation I, I I suspect and the ability to raise affordable capital to actually and, and the capex around it. Um, I, I'm just gonna I'm kind of trying to work out what for me as an investor should be thinking looking in into this space. Does it mean that it could 
accelerate the price recovery for uranium? Does it mean there are going to be, you know, fewer fewer winners as it works? I've always been a kind of we need all of the above kind of guy. But I mean, how, again, from the conversations from the Hague or and and, and quite frankly, for, quite frankly, the financing conversations. How do you think the markets? reading the situation with regards to those who will and those who won't? That's a tough question. I mean, there's there's a number of great uranium companies out there, as we know, and lots of lots of good projects that uh, will come on stream at varying intervals. The key thing about ours, it's it's the largest, highest grade deposit in Africa. It's, it's in the construction phase right now. It's going to start delivering pounds to utilities in 2025. Uh, so, you know, I everybody's got their own timelines and have to go through all the hoops that they have to go through. I mean, this is not an overnight success for Global Atomic. We've been at it for 17 years. Um, and we, we suffered through some terrible periods of time, post Fukushima, everything drying up for 10 years. But the key thing from our point of view is just to keep grinding away and get this thing done. And that's what we're doing now. We're continuing to grind away and getting this thing done. So we want to be a, a solid producer. Obviously, the utilities now have met with us. They have faith uh, in the management team. We've got an absolutely outstanding team here, uh, both in, in Canada and in Niger. And uh, so, you know, they, they think we can deliver, and that's, that's what we have to prove now by getting our plant turned on and the mine running. Okay. Well, look, and also talking, talking of grinding, um, Turkey, um, horrific earthquakes, lo- loss of life, you know, the, the, co- the country is, in, 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 you know, severely affected, and there's some um, you know, horrific stories coming out of there. But for your joint venture there, can I just ask, in terms of getting back up to getting back up to speed, and also the the kind of recovery of the steel market as a whole, um, what what are the, what what is it looking like in country, and what, what can you tell us about that JV? Because quite frankly, that's a big annuity stream of cash for you once that's sort of up and running and 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 flowing. So it's kind of important to your balance sheet going forward as well? Well, I mean, it's got a couple of uh, benefits. One, it uh, has been providing us cash for many years, and now we have a modern plant that'll be good for another 50 years. Um, so it is a long-term cash flowing uh, producing asset. Uh, but the other thing is that people have been asking us since, uh, you know, what are you going to do with it? Um, we've been asked that many times. And you know, from an equity point of view, we could always sell it to raise equity if there's no other alternatives. Uh, you know, it does have value. We have a partner that would love to buy us out. Uh, so that's another way to raise money with no dilution. So, you know, these are things that people need to consider. We do have uh, arrows in our quiver, and we don't need to always come to the equity market. So, you know what, uh, as far as Turkey goes right now, the steel industry got hit hard, particularly in our region. Uh, a lot of mills aren't back to work, back running yet. Uh, we managed to stockpile enough uh, EF, EAFD, electric dark furnace dust. So we are running full right now. So the plant restarted a month or so ago. It'll, it'll run uh, probably for the next couple of months until you know, uh, we need to uh, probably shut down for a period of time to restock the uh, dust supply uh, unless the mills start to producing back up to normal. I would say, you know, they're probably in the 50 range, 50% range right now, 50, 60%. They need to get back up to 80% in order to have us running full all year round. And that'll eventually happen. But I think 2023 is going to be pretty flat year for that operation. Right. Okay. Fine. Appreciate appreciate the update on on that. Um, right. Is there is there any good news out there at the moment? Because the the markets are you know pretty down. You know, your 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 stock's kind of off like everyone else's at the moment. But it, how are you viewing this? Is it head down, get on it? We've got cash. We will deliver. Uh, fo- focus focus on the horizon. Or it, again, do you, do you have any sort of insight as to say, again how this small uranium market of ours um, will fair over the next six months or so? I mean, it, it seems, you know, shareholders, uranium investors, you know, want some good news. Is there any? Uh, I think 
a little bit of patience is required, um, but it's going to come. The the fundamentals out there in our market are they've they've never been as good as they are now. This is the the writing is on the wall. Uh, it's the first time, and this was also announced in the Hague that the, the Democrats and the Republicans both are in agreement that they don't like nuclear; they love it. Okay, that was an exact statement. So this this industry that we're in is in expansion mode. There's going to be a lot more news come out over the next six to 12 months. There is uh, gonna be uh, obviously a clear view on uh, where utilities are gonna source their uranium. And I think uh, even if every project in the world turned on tomorrow, there wouldn't be enough supply. So you know that's not going to happen, and it'll stagger out over many years. So it's 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 going to affect prices, and when the uranium prices start moving up, you're going to see uranium equities move up, but it'll be across the board; they'll all move up, and uh, the ones that are going to be going into production are going to be taking advantage of that rise in price. And we expect it to continue here. And as a matter of fact, when I left The Hague, it was around 50, and it's already added about three or four dollars since then, because there's now new financial players that have entered the market and they are starting to buy physical uranium. So on top of Yellow Cake PLC and Sprott, now there's another one started out of out of Zurich. Uh, they're gonna be buying physical. Uh, the Kazakhs are starting another physical buying program. So on top of the utilities, you've got all the financial players that are now entering the market. That's that's causing a lot of grief, I would say, for utilities that are trying to get cheaper pounds, and it's just not going to happen. 